Okay, so can you guys hear, uh, see my screen? Hear me okay? Yes. yes. Yep. All good? Yep. Awesome. Yes. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining my Wisdom Wednesday. So we have a major water problem. This is true throughout the whole world, but specifically in the US and specifically even more than that, the Southwest. Right now, you've probably seen a lot of pictures like this, the Colorado River drying up, Lake Mead is at all time low levels. Um, places in the Southwest have really run into a problem where things are really drying up. There's epi, you know, there's like uh, droughts that are really large. And the question is, where is all that water going, right? Who's using all the water? Now, you've probably heard that agriculture is a big part of it. And that's true. Agriculture is definitely a big part of the water that's being used. But I'm curious which crop in particular is using the most of the water. You know, is it wheat and grains, right? You know, these things are, are, are in everything, in everything we eat. Um, maybe it's in the fruit. You know, I'm sure you've heard of like the almond trees in California that use a ton of water. Yeah. Or maybe it's corn. You know, we love corn. Corn is great. <laughs> corn is in everything. In America, you have high fructose corn syrup is in everything. It's heavily subsidized product. It's, uh, it's in ethanol. So maybe it's got to be one of those. But what if I told you? that actually the number one most irrigated crop in the U.S. is grass. It's lawn grass. Front yard, good old-fashioned American lawn grass. Now, a fescue or Bermuda lawn grass, that's let's say about uh, 12 inches by 12 inches. So we're talking about one square foot of lawn, right? That annually, if you consider that most people... Is that me muting? No, okay. So if you consider that most people... Uh... Hold on one second. Is my audio on twice or something? Is that someone else? Okay, no, someone else. Fine. So if you consider that, you know, in, in a one square patch of lawn, most people are using way too much water. As you use sprinklers or a hose, um, most of it is getting uh, used up in evaporation. Um, but that square foot of water in a year uses about 135 gallons of water. One square foot over a year is enough water to fill up the back of a pickup truck, which is insane. That's only one square foot. Most yards have over 500 square feet. A 500 square feet of, uh, uh, of yard is going to use enough water to fill up three swimming pools. And 500 square feet of yard is not even that big. I'm here in South Florida. Everyone has a monster lawn. It uses a ton of water. But lawns are a major part of American suburban culture, right? This is something that we're all familiar with. You know, back in the 1950s, after World War II, you had the boomer generation. They all came home, and there's this whole goal for the American dream, right? If you work hard, yeah, you could have your own little slice of pie. You could have your own castle all to yourself. You know, you could have your white picket fence, your two-car garage, and, of course, a massive, sprawling yard. And you're going to spend a lot of time mowing that lawn. Um, but that's, you know, that's part of the American dream. It's so, uh, it's so part of the, uh, uh, of the American culture. But where does this actually come from? Why do we even have lawns to begin with, right? Did we always have lawns? So grass and other types of lawns are actually useful for livestock because if you, when you mow the top layer of the grass, it regrows. So the native mowers, the natural mowers, like cows and goats and sheep and stuff, and horses, you know, they actually do pretty well with grass and these types of plants because they can, uh, they can, uh, they can, you know, chew on it and it can regrow. But how many people do you know that have goats in their front yard? So where is that coming from? So actually, the original source of lawns really goes, has its roots back in rich Europeans, right? This was a major wealth status. This is a major way to demonstrate how wealthy you were, to say, look at the land I have, and I don't even need to grow any food. I can have all these workers, paid or unpaid, that are going to work on maintaining the lawn, cutting it, all that stuff. And I don't even need it for anything. So it was really a way to show off wealth, and that gave off to a lot, a lot of uh, that gave rise to a lot of um, high uh, uh, high society uh, activities like golf, lawn bowling, croquet, all these different things that these Europeans did. And then when those settlers came to America, they brought along that notion of what does it mean to have made it. And this picture on the right that I'm showing you is actually Monticello. That's Thomas Jefferson's estate. Thomas Jefferson, one of the founding fathers, and you know that was like, look, look at this guy who made it, and he has this huge, uh, huge grass yard, and this kind of trickled down into the regular populace, 
populace where grass now became a, a, a staple of the symbol of the American dream that common folk can aspire to. Okay, so now that it's a, it's a part of the staple image, you, know, you, you don't have suburbia without it, you don't have America without grass, but how many resources does it take, right? We already said that it takes an insane amount of water, the number one most irrigated crop in the country, right? That's compared to every single farm that exists in the country. Now you have places, these two pictures are coming in from Palm Springs, California. It's a desert. And you can see that as soon as you exit the property lines, there's no grass. There's almost no plants. It's sand. It's the desert. So what does it take to get grass to grow here in, in a crazy desert with, sun, with so much drought? So first of all, it takes a ton of water. But not just that, because there's a lot of tools in maintaining your lawn, right? People are mowing their lawns. They're using leaf blowers. And that takes up a lot of energy, especially most of them now are still gas. Even electric is, is better, there's no question, but electric just puts the exhaust pipe you know, back at the energy plant. And what do they say? One hour of mowing your lawn is like driving for 40 miles. One hour of leaf blower use is driving 1,800 kilometers, whatever that means. <laughs> I don't know kilometers. But, but you know, this, uh, these, are, these are a huge amount of resources for all of these tools, and they release tons of microtoxins into the air. They're incredibly noisy. And how many man hours do they take? So on average, the days spent in your lifetime is 16 days in your life you're gonna spend mowing your lawn. But that's the average. In places like Georgia, Virginia, Oklahoma, 55, day, 55 days spent per lifetime mowing your lawn. I and mean, this is a crazy amount of man hours in order to keep that meticulous lawn. But of course, if you wanna have that pristine look, you've gotta have your chemicals, right? God forbid one dandelion should show up or one piece of clover so you've got to get those herbicides, you've got to get your Roundup come in and kill all the kill all the all the plants that are showing up. You can't have a single weed in your lawn. What are the Joneses down the street gonna think? And of course, you have to have your pesticides. And because you're when you after you mow the lawn, you take all your glass, your grass clippings. Now, normally these would decompose and bring nutrients back into the soil, but you can't have dead grass on your lawn, God forbid. So you have to take it and throw in the garbage, which means every year you need to put on more and more fertilizer. And what happens after a rain, it's not like these things get soaked into the soil. After a heavy rain, they get wiped off into storm drains, and then they go out into major bodies of water, and they cause huge algae blooms, which sucks out oxygen from places where they're not supposed to be, and kills fish. And Florida, especially on the Gulf Coast, this is a major problem. Places that have uh, fishing as like the tourist industry, um, these chemicals really cause a lot of problems. But okay, fine. So you put in the water, you put in the time, you put in the energy, and now you finally have your little slice of pie with your manicured green carpet of a lawn. But of course you can't go on it, you can't play on it. Make sure your kids don't touch it because you don't want to damage the grass, right? This is about your aesthetic, right? But what if you decide you don't want to, right? Let's say you're like, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't really want to spend all the time. I don't want to spend all the money. I'm just going to stop mowing my grass. Well, you can try, but in many places it's illegal. It's illegal because of local code. And there's many stories of people getting charged. This one guy, he, he had to take care of his sick mother and he left someone to, uh, to mow his lawn and the guy ended up dying and he didn't know about it. And so he got a fine of $500 and every day he didn't resolve it, it accumulated until he had to spend $30,000 and it went to federal court and they upheld it in court or someone else was put in jail or someone else, you know, here's this guy in the top right, this guy's a veteran and he wanted to plant some flowers and now they're taking him to court. Another guy fined $900. So now obviously this doesn't happen everywhere, but especially in places with homeowners associations, HOAs, which are very common in South Florida, there is a lot of uh, pressure on people to really maintain lawns. And sometimes you can get, uh, you can get pretty, uh, you can get uh, really taken, uh, taken care, you can, they can really take care of you. They can really bring you to court for not doing it, but that's okay. If you don't want to, you know, if you still need the aesthetics, you can paint your grass, right? Now there's services that will come out when your grass turns brown because it's not getting enough water. They'll come out, they'll paint it green for you. So if you don't have enough chemicals on your on your land, you can put paint on it, right? But that's important, right? Because obviously, I mean, think of the property value. I have my house, it's my investment vehicle, right? If, 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 my, neighbor has a, if my neighbor has a house that has grass three inches too high, I mean, that's gonna, that's gonna kill the whole neighborhood property value. So obviously, this is really important, right? But okay, fine. So what if we're doing, we're doing all of this and we're achieving this uh, you know, so-called American dream? 
But what if I told you that this American dream was actually an ecological nightmare, right? Now you look at grass and you're like, oh, it's green, right? It's, it's, so it's good for the environment, but it's actually just a plain lawn by itself. A monoculture with only one species is actually an ecological desert, right? Now there's estimate estimate that the insect population has declined by over 45% since pre-industrial times. And that's something that I noticed in my own personal life when we would go on road trips as kid, our windshields would constantly be getting hit by bugs. And that just doesn't happen anymore. At least to me, that's a little bit anecdotal, but the, there's data to back that up. There's a lot less bugs. And what's the problem with, with there not being bugs is that bugs are food. They're food for birds. They're food for frogs, for lizards, for toads, for other types of mammals. And those are in turn food for other things. Those are, those are all a critical part. The, the, the ecosystem is a, is a very delicate balance. And by eliminating the habitat for these kind of animals to, to grow, we have a huge loss of biodiversity, right? And um, <laughs> well, this is like, I like this meme. Why are the bees and butterflies dying out? But here's your yard, right? So like, what, what is an insect supposed to gain from this carpet? The pollinators like, like uh, butterflies, um, bats, um, uh, hummingbirds, um, moths, all these things need flowers. That's how they live. They get, uh, they get, uh, pollen, um, they get nectar from the, from the, from these pollinating plants. Um, and if you don't have these small insects, you don't have the big ones, the birds, they need these small bugs. They need these small berries. They eat the berries. They drop them off somewhere else. They grow new trees. This is all very important. All of our, uh, most of our, our food that we eat, all the fruiting food that we eat relies on pollinators. Right. If you think about, you know, one of the one of the uh, when you think about butterflies, like the first one that comes to your mind is probably the monarch butterfly. It's a very classic butterfly, and it's now an endangered species because the it's the the caterpillar. The the butterfly lays the caterpillar on a very specific type of plant. The caterpillar caterpillar only eats from a specific type of plant. It eats from milkweed, and if there's no milkweed, there's nowhere for that caterpillar to grow into that butterfly and so and so now we have this uh we have this then i mean if you think about caterpillars for a second caterpillars are like the they are the they are like the power they run the world caterpillars run the world right because the sun gives energy to the earth the plants use photosynthesis to take that energy and they use co2 to turn it into food the caterpillars eat those plants which turns them into into bigger animals and bigger insects and that critical part of taking plants converting it into food it's such a huge part of the ecosystem. And there's some birds like a chickadee and needs like between six, each baby, or sorry, like a nest may, may need like 6,000 caterpillars that all comes from within 150 foot radius in order for them to grow to be big. And so when you only have grass that looks like this, you know, how are you gonna get any caterpillars? How are you gonna be able to grow any birds? You know, so this looks like, this looks very valuable, but it's really, uh, it's really an ecological desert. And, Biodiversity loss is a problem for animals, but it's a problem for humans. Humans, we rely on food. We rely on water. We rely on trees. We rely on plants. We need oxygen, and we rely on a healthy native ecosystem. So I want to talk a little bit about native plants, right? What's the concept of a native plant? So if you go to the big box store, you go to Home Depot, and you find a flower that you like, it looks pretty, you bring it home, you plant it in your yard, and then it's probably going to die. It's going to do one or two things, right? It's either going to die, or it's going to take way too many resources to keep alive, or it's going to become an invasive and take over the whole neighborhood, right? Because these are non-native, and these non-native plants are uh, basically a, a plant. A plant that's native is one that has evolved to adapt to a specific environment. And if you ever go to a nature center or a park or anything like that, there's nobody out there with sprinkler system watering the trees. There's nobody out there with a sprinkler system watering the plants, right? Because they've adapted to their local environment. So they know how to handle their environment and nobody has to water them. Nobody needs to fertilize them, right? Because all this happens naturally. So when you think about, compare that to non-native plants, right? They need to have all this extra care, not because that's normal, but because they're in a place where they don't belong, right? So these things don't, uh, don't uh, exist in the wild. These, the concept of irrigation that you need a sprinkler system is, is made up. It's only made up because we're planting non-native plants. And I like this, the, if you look all the way on the left, you can see how deep the roots are for, uh, what's that, uh, Kentucky bluegrass, which is a very common grass here. Very, very shallow. And all these native prairie plants have really, really deep root systems, and they're able to get the nutrients to get the water from really deep down low. So they don't really need any intervention at all. 
Um, and when it comes to insects, insects are typically specialists, right? So it's not just that, obviously bees need flowers and things like that. We spoke a little bit about caterpillars, but most of the insects that eat plants, they, they, only, they, only, uh, uh, they only thrive on the plants where they share a history with, right? Because plants have a lot of ways to defend themselves from getting eaten, right? They have chemicals, they have toxins, they have sticky sap, rough bark, et cetera. And the insects that are in their area learned how to evolve to get around them. But if you buy a plant from Home Depot and plant it in, front, in your front yard, the, the, the native wildlife in your area, they don't know how to get food from that plant, right? And now I wanna talk a little bit about weeds, right? We're all like, we need herbicide, uh, herbicides because we have to get rid of weeds. Well, what if I told you there's no such thing as weeds, right? Weeds is an invention <laughs> by Big Lawn to try and get you to buy their herbicides. What, what, what is a weed, right? What classifies something as a weed? A weed, there's no really definition for it of a certain plant is a weed. Only a weed that you don't want there, any plant that you don't want in a certain place, you could, you could call it a weed, but there's no actual definition of a weed, right? And a weed is actually just an opportunistic plant that they call them pioneer species. These are plants that they're really good at growing in disturbed areas. They grow fast and they, they keep the soil protected from the sun. They can attract wildlife and they can start to repair this area. And I'll go through this a little bit quick, but like when you go through the, the when you take uh, grass and you want to get rid of your weeds, there's no really such thing as weeds. Weeds aren't there because they're actively trying to heal the lawn. So well, what the alternative is, right, if we don't want to, uh, if, we, if we want to embrace this, right, we want to embrace biodiversity, right? You know, they say like, go outside and touch grass. Like that's not enough. We need biodiversity. We need meadows. We need places with a wide variety of native plants where you can attract insects, where you can attract birds. And in our, in our suburban, you know, uh, cultivated life, uh, in, our, in our homes in America, you know, we have to use, uh, we have to use all these um, insecticides because there's, our, our homes are full of uh, mosquitoes and there's bugs that we don't like and there's ants. Well, that's not a problem with biodiversity because there's bugs that come in and they eat other bugs, right? You don't need to kill aphids with chemicals because ladybugs eat them. You don't need to kill mosquitoes with the spray because dragonflies eat them. So if you can create an environment that's biodiverse, you don't need to change anything. You don't need to, to counteract. All these problems are generated from the fact that we have to stick to our traditional values of having green carpet of lawns. But these all just create problems that now we need to solve. But the truth is that none of that's really necessary. So there's actually a growing movement now um, to kind of swing back in the other direction especially in the Southwest right now where droughts are the worst in America. Um, there's a lot of places that will pay you to rip out your grass and to put in, uh, and to put in either native plants or some other kind of, uh, or, or, to or just a non-sprinkler uh, system. The one on the right you can see is a before and after in California. You can see that lawn, what it used to look like. Now there's mulch, there's native bushes, there's shrubs. None of that ever needs to be watered, especially the mulch next to the plants retains the moisture. So just from the rain, and just from plants that belong there, you can have a, and I think, uh, I think it looks much better, but, uh, you know, and there's also um, laws like in, in Vegas, I mean, they're not going to touch the golf courses and the hotels, but at least for houses, you know, they're going to, they're going to ban uh, uh, irrigation, I think in like 10 years or something. So, you know, I don't know if it's going to get there in time, but, uh, but, it, but it's getting there. And you can see, if you look at the, you know, this is two examples, and I, this is such a classic example. You can see in the house on the left, we got the American flag. We got the gas guzzling pickup and we have the manicured lawn. And on the right, you have a house, still an American flag hidden in there somewhere, but this is an ecologist who lives there who realizes the value of oak trees with support over 300 species, 500 species of all these native plants that don't require any care, don't require any upkeep. So that you never have to go work on it. And which one, if you're a bird, which, where, where would you rather live? You know, where are you gonna go looking for your food? So that's the story. So what are some things that we can do um, in our, in, on ourselves you know, if this is something that you're interested in doing, but you, but, uh, you know, you're wondering what could you do to stop? So first of all, what, what could you do to start? So first of all, planting native species, right? And I put that on the bottom four times. Plant natives, plant natives, plant natives. Natives benefit the local ecology. They take very little resources. They benefit insects, they benefit birds. So plant natives, don't plant non-natives. Don't get stuff out of Home Depot and Lowe's and throw them in the ground and, you know, because they look pretty. There's many houses that look pretty and you think that you're being helpful and you're actually an ecological desert because it has no value for local wildlife there. And also there's a big problem now with invasive species. 
people go, they get like these, these house plants, they get like pothos, right? Or whatever, other different types of house plants and they throw them in their yard and then they decimate the area because there's nothing that's evolved to keep them in check and they don't belong here. And there's plants that are coming in from Mexico, from China, from all these other places that look nice, but are actually not just no benefit, but actually harmful. Second of all, stop mowing. If, so, if, you have a, if you have a big yard and you can stop mowing the whole thing, that's great. If you have a yard and you know, you're scared about what the Joneses are gonna think, all you have to do, designate a little smarter of your yard, a little, a little small section, and just stop mowing that one small section. With just a small section of native growing plants that you don't do anything else to, you can have a lot of impact. Mulch is very important. Mulch is like wood chips or straw or other types of organic materials that you lay on the floor next to your plants. And what happens, what mulch does is that as the water rains down, it gets trapped underneath the mulch and it soaks into the soil. And instead of it getting evaporated as soon as the sun comes out, you keep the water for a long time. Composting is a big deal or chop and drop is honestly much easier. If you're gonna go trim your trees, you know, why are you gonna throw, your, why are you gonna throw those leaves in the garbage? <laughs> That's what people do. They cut their grass and they throw in the garbage. They cut their trees, they throw the branches in the garbage, right? <clears throat> but guess what? You can just leave it there. You can just leave it on the ground. Those plants are made up of nitrogen. They're gonna decompose over time. They're gonna become homes for insects and they're just gonna be natural fertilizer. You don't need fertilizer it, you know, in a forest, no one's out there in a the forest fertilizing because as the, 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 the trees have their roots going deep down, they pull nutrients out of the soil into their leaves. The leaves fall and just protect the soil and they decompose and turn back into nutrients. So it's a nice cycle there. You don't need fertilizer. So leave the leaves. I don't know why there's any leaf blowers. I don't know why people rake leaves. There's no value to it. The only value is keeping up with the Joneses. Or if, you, if, you're, if you're nervous about slugs or something, you could rake them in a pile and leave them in a pile. You don't need to throw them in the garbage. Try and avoid chemicals. Try and avoid bug zappers. Bug zappers, you know, uh, you know for, the few minute, for the few minutes I want to sit outside on my porch, I have a bug zapper that runs all night and kills thousands of moths and thousands of bugs. And because we think bugs are icky, so we have bug zappers. If we're going to use them, turn them off. Um, or don't use lights at all because lights are very uh, confusing to recycle. Don't have cats outdoors. Cats are detrimental to bird species. They're really efficient hunters. They're not supposed to be. <laughs> they're they're non-native species. They're cute. They're adorable, but keep them inside. And then there's a lot of ways to attract beneficial wildlife to your house. You have a pile of wood. Um, you can plant. Uh, you can plant uh, 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 native host species for caterpillars. You can plant things that have berries, which are natural bird food. Bat boxes. You know, bats seem scary, but they're actually really good at eating mosquitoes. Um, if if you have a dead tree, you can leave it because birds use that for 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 planting. Um, and instead of water wasting, instead of, instead of using uh, irrigation, you can have a small water feature where things can come and plant. And I do this in my front yard. I have like a little wall. I mean, I never, I never really had a, I'm in a townhouse, so I don't, I didn't take a picture. I, have. I don't have a yard, but I took a small section. I have a little wood pile and I get the lizards. I even got a, a snake in there one time, some frogs. I have a, a trellis with um, some, uh, some host plants and I get like, you go outside, you're like hit in the face with tons of butterflies. It's amazing. Um, another thing I want to mention really quickly is called the Homegrown National Park, right? So now we think that, okay, nature's important, right? We get it, right? So people, what they do is they get rid of all the nature in their front yard, and then they hop in their car, and they drive out to the National Park to go view the nature. It seems crazy to me if you could bring the nature to your front yard, you could sit on your porch, and you could see, you know, you could see it all right there. But so there's this movement of, called the Homegrown National Park, where all these national parks are important, but they're all disconnected from each other. Imagine you have um, all the cities in Texas and no freeways connecting them, or all the cities in the Northeast and no trains connecting them to each other. So you have these pockets of places that are good for the environment, good for the for biodiversity, but they have no way to connect to each other. So this move is, is to say there's 40 million acres of grass in America. Let's take only half, right? Only 20 million acres and plant native species in your yard, convert it into a place where, where plants and animals can be happy there. And with just that, you can create a space larger than all of the national parks put together just from people converting their front, front yards, their backyards, just from people giving a little bit back to, uh, uh, back to the earth. And on that note, I wanna end with one thought, you know, the concept of stewardship, right? This is a, a concept that's, that's, um, that's pretty, uh, pretty common along a lot of different uh, ideologies. 
you know, humans, we're the dominant species on this planet, right? We're awesome. We crushed it. We won, right? There's not, there's not, it's, there's not close. There's not a second place. We're it, right? We can redirect rivers. We can destroy mountains. We can cut down forests. We can plant new forests. We have crazy power over the world around us. And Uncle Ben likes to say, with great power comes great responsibility, right? So our ability to dominate the planet, it gives us a responsibility to the life on this planet. You know, are we going to take and take and take? Are we going to, are we going to, you know, extract as much as possible to try and be as comfortable as we want? Or are we going to step up to the plate as stewards of the earth and all its inhabitants? And if that's not inspired, fine. But humanity itself depends on biodiversity. So we owe it to ourselves and our descendants. Let's cut out the grass. Let's stop mowing. Let's plant natives. Let's give back to our local wildlife. And uh, let's take care of uh, this beautiful planet we have. We only have one. That's it. That's my Wisdom Wednesday. Thank you for listening. Very well done, Ruby. Thanks, Ruby.